Uh, joining me now is Jay Rosen. He's a professor of journalism at NYU, and he is one of the top experts in the country on media. Uh, does media critique from time to time and does it right. Uh, Jay, uh, welcome to uh, Rebel HQ. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on, Cenk. So, Jay, uh, great to have you here. Um, you're doing something interesting uh, called the correspondent.com. I want to talk about t- uh, that uh, about that with you in a second, but. Uh, <laughs> First of all, I want to talk to you about the state of media uh, as we have it here today. Uh, sure. So, um, in in the Trump universe, I feel like the media has gotten a little bit tougher in being watchdogs. Um, one, that was a long time coming, uh, but I think the most important question is, do you think it'll last? Uh, or if we have another establishment president, will they just fall back in line? And, and and mainly accept whatever they're saying. Well, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think they have been shaken a bit by the media climate that they're living through. They they certainly um, had to change some of their practices because of how extreme uh, Trump is. Um, but they're still very powerful forces in the mainstream media that. Um, favor a, on the one hand, on the other hand, world and a, a rough symmetry between the political parties. Um, and the way that political journalism has developed over the last several decades in Washington, especially, it's so dependent on a symmetrical image of how politics works and a, uh, a rough equivalence between the two parties and the, uh, the balanced uh, panel of pundits, um, those things are hugely ground into the assumptions and also the professional experience of the journalists in Washington. So I don't know, I would be a little skeptical that it would snap and that it would change. I think it will probably most likely evolve back to normal if there is a semi-normal administration next time. Yeah, so I'm curious, is it that Washington warps the journalists, or is it what it's taught in the journalism schools? Obviously, that's not what you teach, but um, because I, I think neutrality is the death of journalism, uh, and and yet it feels like that is what's mainly taught. But but I, I don't know nearly as well as you do in terms of what's what's uh, ingrained in in reporters if they go through journalism school. Well, there has been some progress on that. Um, there there's. A greater willingness to call a lie a lie, and even though it doesn't happen all the time, that's still a significant difference. There are people like uh, Jake Tapper who say uh, it's really important for journalists to take a stand in favor of facts and truth, even though he then adds it's important to be agnostic on policy and to be nonpartisan. Um, so it's the idea of um, standing up for truth is there. Air. Um, but I think uh, what, what's happened in political journalism happened several decades ago when the profession of political reporting took a wrong turn and began to focus on the inside game. And political reporters became, in their eyes, specialists in how the game aspect of politics is conducted. So they began to look at the world through the same lens that the pollsters and handlers and strategists and consultants do. And when they did that, they severed their connection to a live democratic public. And they began to look at the electorate through the eyes of the people paid to manipulate it. And that's what I call the savvy style in political journalism. And I'm a critic of that style. I've tried to develop a uh, running critique of that. way of doing things as a journalist. Uh, And I think there are powerful incentives that keep the savvy style in place. There are the corporate incentives of not offending people and drawing the biggest audience and not alienating uh, advertisers. Those things are all true. But there are also professional incentives. Uh, Political reporters have have to specialize in something. Everybody has to specialize in something to, to gain authority. And then what they have decided to specialize in is the game, how you win it, how you win elections, uh, how you prove yourself a savvy player. 
And I think there's uh, a tendency, very strong tendency, in journalists to identify with that game rather than with the voters and uh, the fate of the country. Jay, I, I think there's a second reason why they do that. Because talking about the horse race is safe. It, yeah. it doesn't offend anyone. Sure. Uh, if you have, if you talk about policy, well, you'll have to say things like, "Well, the tax cut tr added tremendous amount to the United States deficit." Yeah, right. That's and, right. And 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 the and the uh, the question, who's going to win, is a non-ideological question. That's right. And so uh, they're taught, or at least in the circle of Washington, the club believes. That you're not supposed to take the size. I mean, look at the example that you gave, right? Uh, the exception proves the rule. Like uh, John Stewart called out Anderson Cooper for having a segment called "Keeping Him Honest." He's yeah. like, shouldn't the whole show be that? <laughs> right? <laughs> and and so when we're talking about like, hey, Jake Tapper is the one guy who's decided that facts matter. Like, whoa, okay. And right. even so, so I, I, I see that. I'm just saying that 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 the germ of the idea is there. He recognizes the idea. No, no, I'm I'm totally with you, and and look, sometimes I give Jake credit, and a lot of times his fact checks aren't aren't that great. Uh, I don't know that he knows it, but uh, so the Medicare for all one was legendarily uh, terrible, uh, and uh, and so I think that he feels the pressure too. Well, if we're going to criticize Trump, we have to crit we have to criticize the left, right or wrong, it doesn't matter. So they say that Medicare for all will save thirty four trillion dollars. I'm just gonna ignore that and I'm gonna do a fact check where it says it'll cost 32 trillion uh, yeah. just because I get to say I criticize the left. Well, I think yes, this is, and this is an aspect of game coverage. It's, it's an aspect of, of the mainstream media that sees itself as necessarily neutral or impartial. A different lens on politics would be a problem solving lens. If you If you were determined to report on how a problem like lack of adequate medical care for a huge portion of the country can be solved, then that your bias would be towards towards that, you know, towards talking about that and, and who has real solutions as opposed to illusory ones. And this is the kind of journalism that I hope the correspondent will be practicing when it gets going, hopefully, later this year. So let's turn to that. Um, so you're also worried about how journalism is funded. Tell us why yes. you're worried about that before you get to the solution. Well, there's a business model crisis in journalism. The um, duopoly, as it's called, of Google and Facebook is sucking up most of the digital ad dollars. The audience is moving online, but the uh, revenue sources are not. Funding from the government is an obvious bust and would be disastrous uh, in the US. Relying on billionaires can be uh, fickle. Uh, and the result is that, uh, especially in local journalism, but also in other uh, parts of the craft, there is at the moment no viable business model for public service journalism. And that's why I've turned toward the membership model, which you are also experimenting with at the Young Turks, um, partly because it, it's a way to support serious journalism and pay people good money to be salaried and professional journalists full time. But it also reestablishes a direct relationship between journalists and the people who support their work. And I think that's extremely uh, important. Finally, I think the advertising economy, the attention economy as a whole, had, uh, especially online, is responsible for many of the things that people really hate the most about news today. Uh, clickbait, sensationalist headlines, story of the day coverage, um, controversies that produce a lot of clicks but not a lot of light, um, and, and sort of the excesses of the online world are all sustained by the need to drive traffic. And of course, traffic will lead to one hopes advertising, but the game is kind of up because Google and Facebook now take about 80% of the, the new digital advertising revenue. And so that is what has led me to believe that membership could be one way out of this mess. So uh, the correspondent.com uh, does things a little bit differently than we do. So yes. we, we have membership where people get extra content uh, if, but there is uh, still a charge, $4.99 a month uh, to, uh, 
at the initial level. How does the correspondent.com do it instead? Okay, so the correspondent.com is the world's most successful member funded ad free news site. They started in 2013 in the Netherlands. They now have 61,000 members who pay 70 euros a year, which is enough to fund 21 full time correspondents and a support staff. Um, and the model is that the members uh, are almost completely the, the sole source of support. And it reestablishes, as I said earlier, a direct relationship between the people who support the journalism and the journalists. Now, uh, membership is different than subscription. Subscription is a product relationship. You subscribe, you get the product. If you don't subscribe, you don't get it. Membership is you join the cause because you believe in the work. If you believe in the work, then you want it to spread even to non-members, which is a model that public radio uses in the United States. I am a member of WNYC. I believe in public radio, but I know that people who are not members are also listening. That doesn't bother me. I want the work to spread to non-members. And so one of the consequences of the membership model is that the correspondent doesn't have a paywall. Any link that you find to its journalism, you can click on, whether you're a member or not. You can share it with other people, whether you're a member or not, and it can travel as far as reader interest will uh, take it. Uh, another interesting part of their model is that they've driven editorial sovereignty downward in the organization so that the 21 full-time correspondents choose their own beats and their own reporting projects. And in exchange for this extraordinary autonomy, they must spend 30 to 40 percent of their time interacting with members and drawing on their knowledge to make the journalism better. And so members are not just involved in funding and supporting the organization financially. They are also supposed to support it with their knowledge, their experience, uh, their expertise. And the correspondent actually creates a database of their members' expertise so they can draw on members' knowledge when needed. So I think that this kind of tighter, more intimate relationship between journalists and members is a different way to go, and I'm excited to try and make it work uh, in the U.S. if we can meet our fundraising goal with three days left in the campaign. Right, so uh, we here at TYT are also in the middle of a membership drive, but I, I brought you on uh, to promote yours because I believe in journalism. And I believe that uh, well, it's, uh, I think what you guys are doing is great and amazing, and I, and I wish it uh, a ton of success. So, the, but you gotta hit a goal, right? Tell us about yes. that. We have a $2.5 million goal, uh, one month campaign, November 14th to December 14th. We are about 2.1 million now, so we're getting very close. We have uh, over 30,000 members from over 100 countries around the world because the correspondent is going to be an English language news site. Uh, and so we're, we're close, but we still need uh, support. And if we reach the $2.5 million goal, then we'll have enough to launch a uh, stripped down sort of minimum viable newsroom version of uh, the the, uh, the correspondent. And then from uh, then on, it will be the journalism and the product that um, develops further members. And so the idea is you uh, raise enough to start and then the product carries you from there. Uh, and so if the campaign is successful, the correspondent will then hire a staff and begin producing journalism sometime in the first half of 2019. All right, sounds great. Everybody check it out, thecorrespondent.com. Uh, and, and Jay is doing this voluntarily to help them out uh, because yeah, he I'm believes in it. Yeah, not getting paid for this. Yeah, not getting paid at all. I just wanted people to, uh, to know that. Uh, so uh, Jay Rosen, uh, professor of journalism at NYU, thank you so much for joining us, really appreciate it. Thank you, Cenk, thank you. On the go, don't worry, we got you covered. You can still listen to TYT at our new podcast network. Find us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or at tyt.com slash podcast.